Should the state be more candid about sudden death? The duty of candor. In the second and third lectures in this series, we talked about inquests, the judicial process in which an independent right judge called a coroner investigates sudden and unexplained deaths. In those lectures, we saw that whereas a criminal trial or civil trial is adversarial, an inquest is meant to be inquisitorial. That means that officially speaking, there are no parties to an inquest and nobody wins or loses. Whereas in a trial, it is the parties who decide what evidence to call and what lines to pursue. In an inquest, it is the coroner, that is the judge, who makes that decision. Despite the inquest being nominally non-adversarial, however, inquests are often battlegrounds in which interested persons skirmish over almost every issue. Public authorities, companies, and other powerful actors who are implicated in the death will normally hire expensive legal teams and fight tooth and nail to avoid findings that might damage their reputation, their image, or expose them to criminal or civil liability. We also explored the changes in inquest law and practice over the past 30 years. We saw that the brief family of the deceased used to have very few rights in an inquest, no legal aid, no disclosure, and very little opportunity to participate in the process. And we also saw that this has improved somewhat over the past decades as a result of the European Convention on Human Rights. But we are still far from achieving equality of arms for brief families. We considered some of the ways that the inquest process could be fairer. Well, today, we're gonna focus on the issue of disclosure. When I first started representing brief families in inquest more than 30 years ago, there was virtually no disclosure. The lawyers for the institution involved in the death, such as the police or an NHS trust, would turn up with boxes of papers, none of which we, the lawyers for the brief, would be allowed to see. We didn't have the right to see these documents. We didn't get to see the statements of the witnesses in advance, so we couldn't identify holes in their stories and prepare to ask them about these in cross-examination. We didn't get to see the records held by the public authorities so that we might well miss out on important clues as to how the deceased died and whose fault it was. The brief families were largely shut out of the process. In my second lecture in the series, I told the story of one of my most courageous clients, Anne Power, who at the inquest into the death of her husband in 1998, was not given access to the witness statements. Because of this, neither she nor the jury knew that two police officers involved in her husband's death had made witness statements which were almost word to word identical nor did she have the opportunity to request an adjournment so that a key civilian witness whose account she had not seen could attend the inquest. Mrs. Power didn't give up the fight for justice and thanks to her tireless efforts, the divisional court in 2017, almost two decades later, ordered a new inquest. Nowadays, things are a little better. There is now explicit provision for disclosure in the rules and the brief family generally now does get does get to see the evidence that is going to be relied on at the inquest but that isn't the whole story because the evidence that is going to be relied on at the inquest doesn't always tell the whole story this lecture is going to focus on a key question should public authorities in inquest be under a duty of candor? Now, when lawyers say that a party is under a duty of candor in a particular type of proceedings, it means that the party has an obligation to be open and honest with the court and the other parties, to lay its cards on the table and to disclose information and documents in its possession 
even if these undermine its case. Now, there are a variety of circumstances in which the law imposes a duty of candor. For instance, public authorities in judicial review proceedings are under a duty of candor. But should there be an explicit duty of candor in inquests? Should public authorities have to proactively disclose information in their possession, including information that paints them in a bad light? I want to introduce Pete Weatherby, Queen's Counsel from Garden Court North Chambers. Pete is a friend of mine and also an experienced human rights lawyer who led the team representing 22 of the Hillsborough families and who has acted in many inquests and public inquiries over the years. He's also a trustee board member of Inquest a Charity. He has long experience in holding public authorities to account. Now, Pete is going to talk about what is going wrong and what needs to be changed. After that, he and I are gonna have a free flowing discussion and there will be time for questions, hopefully at the end. Pete, over to you. Thanks very much, Leslie. Uh, and thank you very much for the invite uh, to speak at this uh, uh, lecture. Um, in the trial of the police officer accused of murdering George Floyd and of course subsequently convicted, the Minneapolis police chief gave evidence for the prosecution asserting that the force used against Mr. Floyd was unreasonable and that none of his officers provided first aid or medical attention. The actions of the officers were contrary to the policy of his force and contrary to its ethics. That was an example of a senior public servant acting with candour and some might argue contrary to the narrow direct interests of his institution. Why did he do so? It may well be that he saw the actions of Derek Chauvin as abhorrent or he may well have realised that the actions of Chauvin in the full public glare filmed by witnesses were indefensible and it was therefore necessary to throw him under the bus to salvage anything for his police force. But whatever was actually in his mind, the right approach was to see the true interests of his organisation as concordant with the public interest. And if he did so, he was correct. In such circumstances, the public interest involve, inevitably involves looking for what actually happened, the truth. Uh, looking for what went wrong, accountability. And looking at what should change, making things better. And regrettably, all too often, public officers and the managers and controlling minds of private corporations who make money out of activities which cast responsibilities on them for public safety fail to act with candour and act in their own narrow interests and those of their organisation. Sometimes direct lies are told. Sometimes the facts are manipulated. Sometimes omissions are made which impede the search for truth. In this country, and no doubt many others, when things go wrong and there are official investigations, there is a culture of denial and a pervasive institutional defensiveness. Instead of a collaboration to work out what actually happened, what failures occurred, who should be held accountable and how we can change things for the better, public investigations and inquiries turn into what one advocate recently termed a carousel of blame. And by that, I do not mean bereaved families and other victims legitimately looking for accountability. What I actually mean is public authorities and private corporations instructing lawyers to spin the facts, offload responsibility to others and work out litigation strategies to limit reputational and financial damage. There is no inevitability to that. It is a choice of self-interest over public interest. Although there is no absolute silver bullet, the key to unravelling institutional defensiveness is a duty of candour. Lack of candour causes miscarriages of justice and subverts the nature and purpose of inquisitorial processes. Because it often arises or perhaps more accurately, it is often noticed 
in high profile cases such as Bloody Sunday, Grenfell uh, and many others. It undermines public confidence in both public authorities and private corporations and in the legal process itself. Lack of candour has become so normal that the mention of a chief of police in a faraway trial telling it how it is, is remarkable. It is neither a new phenomenon nor one which has just become apparent. There have been countless inquiries and inquests where chairs and judges have remarked on failures of candour and that something really must be done about it. 30 years ago, in one famous inquiry, a senior judge remarked that the reliability of the police evidence he had heard was in inverse proportion to rank. A decade ago, Sir Robert Francis, chair of the Midstaff's NHS inquiry, directly called for a statutory duty of candour. Similarly, in the Morecambe Bay NHS inquiry, the Harris inquiry, two inquiries by Dame Eilish Angelini, and in many others, there have been direct calls for legal reform of this nature. I think it's important to reflect on two matters. As a senior judge once asserted in an iconic judgment, in law, context is everything. The context of a lack of candour by those responsible for public safety and public security in particular is that it affects people whose lives have been devastated by tragedy. The families of those who were killed on Bloody Sunday deserve better than to be subjected to decades of state cover-up. The families of those who died in the Grenfell fire, or those who died as a result of the blood contamination scandal, or as a result of various failures in the healthcare sector, or by chronic failures in mental health settings or prisons, or those who died in sporting tragedies, all deserved better at what is always the lowest point in their lives. That should not be forgotten. This is not a dry legal argument about duties and responsibilities. It is a real major problem affecting real ordinary people, affected by failures by state institutions and corporations who should not then be subjected to a second indignity by a closing of ranks and what is often a casual aversion to scrutiny. So, on the one hand, lack of candour must be seen firmly in the context of its effect on victims. But there is another corollary context. Lack of candour sets public authorities and officials apart from the people that they are supposed to serve. I referred to litigation strategies earlier. That was a phrase used by an eminent lawyer in a recent training session for those who represent public authorities at inquests and public inquiries. That lawyer went on to assert that such processes often illuminated evidence and elicited admissions which were later used in litigation. And therefore public authorities and their lawyers need to have a litigation strategy to deal with that. Well, so far, so good, you might think. Nothing actually wrong with recognising that bringing out the true facts of a disaster may have other consequences. But this is where there is a fork in the road. What was actually being trained was a litigation strategy which encouraged public authority lawyers to do everything they could, of course within the professional rules, to avoid their witnesses making admissions or exposing embarrassing facts. This is the crux of the problem. We either have a system which allows public authorities to adopt litigation strategies similar to the gangster in a criminal trial, or similar to the aggressive corporation who will use every device to avoid civil liability. Or we put in place clear legal rules which require public authorities and corporations who are responsible for public safety to put aside that sort of self-interested strategy and simply act in the public interest. That is, the imposition of a codified, effective, statutory duty of candour. This is not some utopian idea, 
It is not a proposal which requires any philosophical or jurisprudential quantum leap. In the criminal sphere, the prosecution is not permitted to adopt a win-at-any-cost approach. The duties on lawyers for the prosecution and defence are not symmetrical. In a recent high-profile case, prosecution advocates put this very clearly. We suffer no defeats and enjoy no victories. That means prosecution advocates should only have the interests of justice in mind, which is the public interest in prosecuting alleged wrongdoers. They have no personal or institutional position which involves winning. On the other hand, criminal defence lawyers protect the rights of the individual, irrespective of their guilt or innocence. There is no equivalence with lawyers instructed to represent public authorities in any legal process. Public authorities have no rights or interests separate from the public interest. Like prosecuting lawyers, they should suffer no defeats and enjoy no victories. So, back to the inquiry into Midstaff's NHS, which was set up to scrutinise why there were such high mortality rates in certain hospitals. The shout out of the inquiry chair, Robert Francis QC, concerning the need for new legislation was actually heeded, albeit to a very limited extent. In 2014, the government brought into force new healthcare regulations, which included a statutory duty of candour. The Health and Social Care Act 2008 Regulated Activities Regulations 2014 are a model of how not to draft laws. And the early research into their effect found that the provisions have made little difference. However, once bedded in, research from 2018 and 2019 has been a little more promising. The provisions are designed to change the culture of defensiveness within healthcare from a default position of covering up mistakes to one of informing patients, managers, and regulators proactively, and of course apply consequentially to inquests and inquiries. An effective duty of candour empowers conscientious officials and workers to expose systemic and individual failings before they repeat, and undermines the burying of inconvenient facts which may have occurred through wrongdoing, mistake, or lack of proper systems or resources. The early lessons from the Francis reforms are that a statutory duty is necessary, but it needs to be comprehensible to all and comprehensive in affecting all areas of life and not just healthcare. Why would such a duty be required for doctors and nurses, but not for police officers and local authorities, and in particular, anyone with a responsibility for the safety of the public? By 2017, following a series of inquests and inquiries which had highlighted this lack of candour problem, Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Manchester but then an MP, introduced the Public Authority Accountability Bill to Parliament, which did provide comprehensible provisions, a law written in plain English, and a duty with comprehensive application and practical and effective compliance tools. Although put before Parliament by Andy Burnham, it was actually sponsored by MPs from all the main parties to ensure that it was clearly non-partisan and it had its first reading unopposed. Regrettably, its progress was then halted by the general election, never to be reintroduced by subsequent governments. More of that later. In just about all other areas of legal jurisdiction in this country, there are comparative provisions requiring candour. In criminal proceedings, pursuant to Section 5 of the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act 1996, the alleged perpetrator is required by statute to file a defence statement setting out the parts of the prosecution case with which he or she disagrees and setting out his or her positive defence. In civil proceedings, pursuant to parts 15 and 16 of the civil procedure rules. A defendant must likewise set out what is admitted, the points of disagreement, 
and facts averred in the pleadings. Criminal and civil processes are, of course, adversarial. In public law proceedings, judicial review, part 54 requires a defendant to file detailed grounds for contesting the claim. But in inquests and public inquiries, there is no comparative provision. Take a moment to get your head around that one. In adversarial processes in both public and private law, the parties have to set out their positions, what they allege did and did not happen, and what was wrong. Yet in inquisitorial processes, that is, ones which exist not to determine disputes between warring parties, but to determine an official narrative and to try to improve things for the future, the formal provisions do not require the participants to assist the process in the same way. Indeed, on the face of the actual provisions, participants are entitled to sit on their hands and see what they can get away with. How on earth has that been allowed to happen and to persist? Is it simply because there are no statutory requirements of frankness and candour at inquests and public inquiries, which require proactive engagement and thereby admissions? That is something argued, but it does not stand scrutiny. In other public law processes, such as judicial review, there is a well-developed common law duty of candour. In Huaro versus the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, one of the Chagos Islands cases involving the displacement of indigenous people from their homeland by the UK, Lord Justice Singh reviewed and set out what is required by the common law duty of candour in judicial review proceedings. It should be remembered that this case involved what Mr Justice Oosley recorded as, and I quote, the shameful treatment of the Chagossians in a case in which the Secretary of State admitted, and again I quote, that the removal and resettlement of the Chagossians was accomplished with callous disregard of their interests. In that context, Lord Justice Singh asserted that public authorities not only have a duty to disclose, but they have a clear duty to make sure the court is not misled by omission. The court and claimants must not be left to look for what Lord Justice Singh expressed as needles in the haystack. There is a need for the public authority to identify, and I again quote, the good, the bad and the ugly. Public officials and public authorities must proactively assist the court and the process by telling it how it is. There are, and again I quote, not engaged in ordinary litigation, trying to defend their own private interests. Rather, they are engaged in a common enterprise with the court to fulfill the public interest in upholding the rule of law." Unquote. If the common law recognises this duty and the senior judiciary sets it out in such trenchant terms, why then has it not been recognised and applied in inquisitorial jurisdictions, at least until recently? Isn't the same common enterprise with the court to fulfil the public interest in upholding the rule of law even more central to inquisitorial processes than in judicial review proceedings? It is interesting that the common law duty of candour has been set out with such clarity in a case with an international context because the duty of candour has a close relation in the emerging international law principle of the right to know, sometimes expressed as the right to the truth. In a number of Strasbourg and inter-American court cases, there's been a recognition that often the state is in a unique position of knowledge. This is particularly true in cases of detention, security operations, and disappearances. The principle was set out with particular clarity in the extraordinary rendition case of El Masri versus Macedonia, where the Grand Chamber held that candor by the authorities was essential in rebutting the appearance of collusion with wrongdoing or tolerance of unlawful acts. It is a fact, as Leslie referred to earlier, that disclosure in the inquest process was virtually non-existent until the late 1990s. 
inquisitorial proceedings were things done by the state and bereaved families and others affected by disasters were at best patronised and at worst tolerated. On one side of the coroner's court sat rows of counsel for the relevant authorities with boxes of papers all funded by the taxpayer. On the other side of the court sat an advocate for the family if they were lucky because there was no public funding available with perhaps a post-mortem report and precious little else. There is no doubt that the coming into force of the Human Rights Act drove a stake through the heart of the justifications not to disclose in unnatural death cases. The investigatory obligation inherent in Article 2, the right to life, requires the effective engagement and participation of the bereaved. But disclosure is only a start to candor, a backdrop. Without a well-developed and defined legal duty, there are several drivers to obfuscation and avoidance of responsibility. At one end of the scale, there is human weakness, an inherent reluctance to accept error and failure. At the other end, there is corruption, with the concoction of false narratives and barefaced lying. In between, there is a fear of consequences, a fear of letting the side down. Avoiding reputational damage and liability trumps truth. It leads to instructions to lawyers to present the public authority or corporation not only in the best light, but to avoid censure and to avoid admissions which may lead to litigation. Drilling down into that, there is no real professional difficulty for the lawyer so long as they stay within the usual ethical boundaries. But there is a real problem for both the public authority or corporation and the process. The mission of any public authority must be grounded in acting in the public interest. The only instructions compatible with that mission must be to come clean, disclose everything potentially relevant and act in a genuinely transparent way to further the public interest. Whether or not that exposes the institution and its officers to censure and litigation or even prosecution. It's accepted that the position of corporations may be viewed differently as the officers have a duty to shareholders. But where the corporation is contracted to do public works or where it adopts a responsibility for public safety, why should it too be subject to different requirements of frankness, transparency and candour. Whether the lack of candour problem results from misguided loyalty, corruption, human weakness, perceived duties to shareholders or whatever doesn't really matter. The point is to recognise the problem rather than its cause and the real issue is the solution. In advancing the Public Authority Accountability Bill in 2017, it was argued that the existing common law duty of candour needed codifying and it needed a statutory toolkit to make it practical and effective. Without codification, without defining the ambit of the duty, those who are under scrutiny are free to make an interpretation which renders the notion of candour meaningless. What do I mean by that? Well, without definition, those with something to hide may choose to take a restricted view of disclosure, only address matters in witness statements that are specifically raised with them and seek to avoid scrutiny and exposure. Without proper codification, no compliance mechanisms, a fine meal may be cooked, but there's no cutlery with which to eat. So what's required? Well, critically, the bill provided that both public authorities and private corporations which contract to undertake enterprises engaging responsibility for public safety will be required to provide position statements to investigations, setting out a narrative of their own involvement in the matters under consideration, including any failures and omissions. An intentional or reckless failure to comply with this proactive duty would render the chief officer or chief executive liable to criminal sanction. Other concurrent duties were also included in the bill, including a duty on public officers and ex-public officers 
to assist inquiries and provide witness statements. It may come as a surprise to many that there is a real problem with some ex-public servants declining to assist public inquiries and inquests. In 2016, the former Bishop of Liverpool was commissioned by then Home Secretary Theresa May to prepare a report into the experiences of bereaved families at large-scale inquests. The report highlighted candour amongst other things and rolled out a voluntary charter to which public and private institutions would sign up, promising to be frank with inquiries in the future. Not only has the government failed to respond to the various recommendations made by the bishop, but there has been a very poor take-up of the charter more generally. For example, at the Grenfell inquiry, there are an array of public authorities and corporations involved, yet only two of them, London Mayor Sadiq Khan and the local council, in fact, RBKC, signed up to the charter. Not even the central government departments or the London Fire Brigade had bothered to put their names to it. At the Manchester Arena inquiry, I'm unaware of anyone other than the Manchester Mayor who signed up. There has been a resounding no comment, a definitely deafening silence from the government to the 2017 bill. And it will be unrealistic to imagine that it will be re reintroduced in this parliament, given the present wish to rein back judicial review generally and row back from the Human Rights Act. But happily, it appears that despite a lack of government take up or institutional interest in a voluntary scheme, recognition of the existing common law duty and the clamour to make a duty of candour effective has taken hold. Last year, a working party of the influential law reform charity Justice published a report, When Things Go Wrong, which looked at how the inquisitorial response to disasters and catastrophes should be improved. The working party included three former High Court judges who together have vast experience of high profile inquests and public inquiries into controversial and multiple death cases, as well as a gallery of leading barristers, solicitors and academics in this area. The report endorsed the pressing need for a statutory duty of candour. On the ground, judges and inquiry chairs have become much more receptive to arguments for position statements based upon the duty of candour with the use of existing powers and case management tools to compel, in effect, public authorities and private corporations to set out what amount to position statements in advance of hearings. There is a way to go and there remains the clearest need for codification and statutory powers in this area. For the legitimate complaints of the bereaved and other victims of disasters and other controversial death cases are now seen to be much more mainstream and concordant with the general interests of justice. Judges and inquiry chairs have seen the utility of compelling all participants in inquisitorial proceedings to identify and narrow the issues, to assist in applying the increasingly limited investigatory resources to areas that are actually an issue rather than ones which are not. Increasingly, judges and inquiry chairs have recognised that there is no legitimacy to public servants and authorities and indeed corporations impeding the course of inquisitorial processes by spurious claims that they do not want to preempt the inquiry conclusions, or worse, that they have some claim to a right to silence or at least passivity. Judges and inquiry chairs are recognising the common cause between the rights and aspirations of the breed families and the efficient progress of the process through requiring candour from those who bore responsibilities which may not have been discharged. There is therefore room for optimism. Justice requires the brightest lights being shone into the darkest corners. The duty of candour is one of those bright lights in the same way as disclosure failures are often identified as the drivers of miscarriages of justice in the criminal arena, a failure of candour 
has led to huge delay in identifying systemic failures in the field and caused miscarriages of justice in ensuing inquests and inquiries. If anyone needs to be persuaded that there is a need for an effective duty of candour, it's worth reflecting on the vehemence with which lawyers for public authorities and corporations argue against the need for position statements and inquisitorial processes. Not just vehemence, but in fact remarkable ingenuity. With advocates for public authorities sometimes arguing that position statements are somehow adversarial. The reality is really rather clear. Position statements direct inquisitorial processes, facilitate case management, prevent directing minds from hiding or obfuscating the real facts, result in earlier and shorter hearings because those investigating can see the wood for the trees. In doing so, it also assists the bereaved and others affected, and it must lead to significant savings in resources. There remains the clearest need for codification and statutory compliance powers, lest the failures of the past become the calamities of the future. Thank you, Pete. That was great. That was a really good um, talk and gave, certainly gave me a, a, a more detailed understanding about the issues surrounding this duty of candour. Uh, I've got a few questions. Would you mind, you know, having a little debate with me on that? Of course. So, firstly, we looked at the right to know as an emerging international concept. But can you just help me with this? Hmm. How has that come about and why is it significant? Well, it's um, significant. Let me do it in reverse order. It's significant because it's kind of concurrent and concordant. It runs together with this concept, which is perhaps more domestic, of du duty of candour. But it's really the same thing, branded slightly different. So um, in terms of the emerging international concept, um, the international courts, particularly Strasbourg and the Inter-American Court, have through a series of um, very serious cases um, developed this notion that there are um, circumstances where the state holds all of the information so if you, if you like, um, there's a whole series of Turkish cases involving disappearances, very much in the um, context of the Kurdish situation. Yes. Um, and so the court has imposed a duty on the state to proactively come clean, you know, act with candour to say where, where that person is or was last seen and what investigations there have been into their dis disappearance. And that has then been extended to a whole range of state context, for example, detention cases, where again, somebody goes into detention. And unless you impose a duty of candor on the state, you're not going to learn what happened to that person um, um, if they die, for example, in custody. And you can so see you can, you can see the applicability in custody deaths because oftentimes the, the only witnesses um, as to how a death occurred because the person was, say, in a prison or in a yeah. police cell are going to be state agents themselves. So Well, exactly. I mean, many of the cases that you and I both um, have done over the years, very sad cases involving... Um, deaths in prison where people have died very, very often um, alone in a cell. And really all the information has to come from the state itself and from the initial investigations that the state has, has done. So that's, that's why the international courts have, have um, developed this concept of putting the onus on, on the state. But there's also a second stream, if you like, of cases. And the, and the best one, best entry point here is the Honor Yildiz case, um, which again, another Turkish case, which is the case involving an explosion yes, at a, a refuse um, collection um, installation. And a number of people who lived there or lived close by 
um, were killed. And it, it's a very significant case on a number of different levels. But one of the matters that the Strasbourg court was particularly keen on was the fact that Article 2 imposed this duty to let people know. And one of the findings against the Turkish state was that they had knowledge of dangers at this installation, which they hadn't made public and thereby deprived ordinary people of the ability to make up their mind, for example, where they went or where they lived. And you can see uh, issues uh, in cases such as Grenfell. Absolutely. Of materials used and what um, contractors may or may not have known. Yeah, absolutely, Leslie. I think I think that's that's absolutely hits the nail on the head that that, that what is emerging through the Grenfell inquiry um, is absolutely on this point that the truth of the um, issues about the materials that were used on the tower um, or misused on the tower, perhaps more accurately, were were held back from those who lived there. So absolutely the right to know um, is engaged fully in that concept. And it, as I say, it overlaps uh, and runs in the same channel, if you like, as the well, duty of candour. It's the same well, thing. Well, at the time of this lecture, Grenfell's still running, so it'd be interesting to see yeah. when the report eventually comes out what is said about that. But let me move on. Mm. Uh, let me ask you, do you think the, the candour issue is related to lack of funding for bereaved families and other victims? Yeah, I think that um, as I tried to uh, develop in, 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 in the talk, that lack of candor, it comes from a ver variety of different sources, but one of them is, the, is this notion of the fact that historically inquisitorial processes are done by the state. And it's, and it's a remarkably modern um, development that again, you and I both and many others have been involved in developing particularly through the Human Rights Act, for this notion of effective participation. So um, apart from the corruption issues and the human weakness issues and, and not letting the side down and avoiding litigation, I think there is this historical point um, that the state does in inquisitorial processes um, and the bereaved and those affected are often a kind of a, an embarrassment to the process. That's very much my experience when I started that, that the bereaved were not made welcome um, at, at the inquest of their own loved ones. Yeah, I, I, well, I, 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 in fact, I deal with that in, I think, the second lecture. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Um, that was very much my experience that lawyers, was, lawyers for the family were seen as, as a nuisance and not there as part of the process. I think I'd take it further than that. I'd say not just lawyers for the families but but oftentimes the, the families themselves although you know coroners would often patronize them they didn't make them very welcome um, and they certainly didn't want to involve them um, so I think that um, you know candor and lack of funding can be seen as two distinct parts of the same problem if you like um, but you know it's still an absolute scandal that um, there is an absence of funding for the bereaved at inquest. And as you said in your introduction, I followed with, you know, we, you and I are both old enough um, to remember um, the bad old days, the very bad old days, where not only was there a complete lack of funding, but we were excluded by disclosure. Yeah. Um, and this is something which has gone on for forever, and everybody knows about it, and no government um, has yet um, committed to funding the bereaved. So people set out as victims you know they don't choose to be victims of, of disasters or calamities or often caused by failures of one part of the state or another um, but then they suffer the second problem that they can't be effectively involved in the process because they can't afford lawyers so the state gets them the taxpayer to pay for their lawyers and then I doesn't provide funding for for, for the brief to be Represented. I always make the point that the bereaved is receives a double insult. Firstly, that they are not funded, but through their taxes, they are paying for the lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. For, for the state agents. I mean, but, it's a shocker, isn't it? Yeah. So, but look, uh, uh, um, I want to see if I can add some 
um, balance. I'm not saying that your your talk has been uh, unbalanced mm. by any way, but if I was representing a state agent, there, I've heard the argument in opposition to the duty of count, candor. It's a counterintuitive argument. Mm. The argument goes that if you introduce this duty of candor, you're likely to have a situation whereby you get less information because it becomes more litigious. Mm. Um, you know, uh, if, if you've got position statements yeah. and um, a, an inquisitorial process such as a public inquiry or an inquest will become really adversarial and therefore it's a bad thing. What would you say to that argument? I'm sure, is, I'm sure that's an argument you've heard before. <laughs> Frequently, I regret to say. Um, I have to say that on, well, first of all, you know, no one will actually argue with you against candour. There's a pretense that there's no need for a duty of candour because everyone's open and transparent and wants to help, which is manifestly not the case. Um, but it, it's with some exasperation that I hear this argument that the, um, uh, the wish for position statements um, is adversarial or, or litigious. I mean, I, I'm exasperated because um, it just can't be right. Um, and the move in, the, you know, as I was saying about the criminal arena or you know, civil process since time began, really, has required people to come to court without am ambushing each other. Um, and here, you know, we have the state with lots of, very often with lots of information. And, you know, how can it be adversarial to require them simply to put it on the table and to explain to the judge or the chair or the coroner and to the bereaved and to the public and the media? How can it be said to be adversarial um, to basically require them to set out what they say about the facts that they have? Um, I don't can understand I, it. Can, can I, I don't think it's adversarial at all. Can I give an example? I'm involved in a case at the moment where the partner of the deceased person goes to a hospital to find out how her loved one died. When she left her loved one, he was in good health, mm. with no bruises or injuries on his body. Yeah. When she goes and asks a simple question, what happened? Can you tell me? She is told to lawyer up. Yeah. You can't speak to get lawyers. Well, what do you think that as a message sends to an individual? Well, I think that, you, you, again, you, you've, uh, you've knocked it on the head there, Leslie, that, um, that you, you're giving a real, real, real example of where the state... Um, authority, the public authority involved is saying we're not going to talk to you because this is going to be adversarial and we're going to draw a line in the sand and we'll have our lawyers over here and you'll have your lawyers over there. So it starts off with an entirely legitimate, normal inquiry by your client. How did their loved one die? And met by a brick wall, which is go and get yourself a lawyer. And frankly, go and get yourself a lawyer if you can afford it. Um, and that is adversarial. That response is adversarial. What, what is required, of course, with the duty of candour is for, for this public authority to, to actually sit the person down and say, well, this is what happened, warts and all. And sometimes they, what they will do is they will allay um, misconceptions that somebody may think that something's happened which hasn't and the information can help. Uh, address that and sometimes of course they, they, it requires people to own up to wrongdoing or mistakes uh, and you know there's nothing wrong with requiring people to own up to wrongdoing or mistakes. Yeah. You um, make a very good point actually that it's a point that I've seen um, over the years that if public authorities were just more open um, with how somebody um, came by their death. Generally speaking, that's all um, clients want. They, you know, they're not interested in litigation. They're just interested mm -hmm. in knowing the truth. 
Absolutely. And by, um, you know, not being candid about the circumstances, that in itself leads to litigation and that is often lost. Now, we'll come to the end of our, our, our time. Mm. This has been fascinating. Mm. But there's a really important, well, it's the elephant in the room question. You said earlier that this bill, right, this um, uh, bill was sponsored yeah. by um, MPs from all parties. So it had cross-party support. Mm. Well, Pete, why isn't it law now? Well, I mean, the way it was advanced was that it was driven by families who had suffered from a complete uh, lack of candour. And they were very pleased that Andy Burnham advanced it. Um, and they and their lawyers had, had written it. Um, and they said to Andy Burnham, look, it's great that you're doing it, but we don't want you to do it. We want you to lead it but we only want you to put it forward effectively on behalf of the breed if you can get people from all the parties involved, because otherwise it becomes a party issue and nothing gets done. So Andy Burnham, and no doubt with support from others, did a great job and he got Tory MPs, uh, Lib Dems, um, SNP, um, Plaid Cymru, um, the SDLP, the Greens, uh, Across the board, not only to support. I, I, I should say this: those are all the m uh, major political parties in the UK. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, excepting the DUP and Sinn Fein, yeah. uh, but of course Sinn Fein uh, don't sit. So, um, um, so all but the DUP, effectively. Um, but not not only did they support it in terms of agreeing to vote for it, but they actually signed the bill. They sponsored the bill, and that was the point. So everything possible was done to make this a joint enterprise, a conspiracy, if you like, to get, get this um, sensible law um, passed. And nobody spoke against it in Parliament and nobody has spoken against it since. But it, I'm afraid the, the reality is that certainly this government, um, certainly other, certain other governments are averse to scrutiny and don't want to have... Um, transparency laws, really, um, and that is part of part of the problem. Um, but also, there will be powerful people who are not prepared to put their head above the parapet to um, argue with you and me and whoever else and bereaved about this, um, because they know that it's a sensible argument. But they simply don't want a statutory duty of candour. If um, I was being cynical, um, mm. that is because I would say that. Um, the, the, you know, the, the government would find itself having to be very candid about um, decisions and steps. Yeah, and yeah like I mean, at the moment, the, um, um, there's a very large number of um, uh, COVID bereaved who are running a very effective campaign for a public inquiry into, into the deaths of their loved ones. And they're being batted away by the government. Um, and that's what I mean by them, this government being averse to scrutiny uh, generally. And I think that is a big problem. But if you, if you, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating here. If you want to see how effective the duty of candour is, listen to public authorities arguing against it and these arguments that we were discussing earlier. But they argue against position statements, which is, of course, a, a manifestation of, of the duty of candour. Uh, so vehemently, because frankly, it's effective in requiring them to come clean. Let, let me ask, we're nearly out of time, and let me just ask you this last question. Do you do issues of lack of candour involve or contribute to discrimination, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Why? You know, I mean, you've, you've been involved in um, many uh, controversial police custody and police shooting deaths and um, Obviously, they disproportionately involve young black men. Um, the uh, COVID situation, you know, disproportionate number of um, deceased from particular communities, particular black communities, particular Asian communities. Um, and so, you know, where you have a lack of candor, it is going to have 
a disproportionate effect on on those communities and contribute to discrimination well look pete i want to thank you for taking the time to come and uh, you know be a guest lecture in part of this series i i, I want to summarize what we've discussed in this way should there be a duty of candor in these types of proceedings where the state is involved in sudden and unexpected death i think certainly from our point of view this certainly should be the state doesn't lose anything the state has everything to gain mm. proceedings become less adversarial mm. surely it's getting to the truth is what matters. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie.